William Ayotte, welcome to the show. Hello, Brett. Good to hear your voice. Well, good to hear your voice. So you wrote a book that I, w- that I really enjoyed, Reenchanting the Forest, Meaningful Ritual in a Secular World. You are a poet. You have led rituals for men and for other people as well. And you're making the case that even though we live in a secular world, we need more rituals. So what got you down the, the path, started down the path of exploring the power of rituals in human life? To be really frank and honest, I think it was necessity. I was in trouble personally. I was about 30 years of age. I was isolated. I was cut off. I was hurting. And at a certain point, I discovered that my past was even darker than I had pretended. And I joined a men's group. And it turns my, turned my life around. We were doing ritual in that space. And it really changed everything. It was like uh, discovering a new map of the world. And at that point, I think that I kind of altered the way I saw things in the world and altered the way I saw myself. And that was a big experience. I mean, before this experience with the the men's group and the rituals they did there, I mean, what was your experience with ritual before? Was it just in the confines of church? No, I'm not a, I'm not a churchman. And, and though I come from a a family of churchmen, oddly enough, but um, I had experienced ritual because I had been to an English boarding school. I had been to national football matches, you know, in, in the way that the Super Bowl is a ritual, the FA Cup final in the United Kingdom is a ritual. So I was used to the ritualization of things, but I hadn't really experienced deep healing rituals. I hadn't experienced those sort of things. And it wasn't until I got into a men's group, which was literally a ritual men's group, as defined in those days, that I began to realize that ritual served me and served a deeper part of me. So there, there are still rituals today, even though we might not think of them as rituals. Like you said, like a sports game is a ritual. Sure. There's, there are civic rituals that every country has. But Absolutely. there aren't the type of rituals that we, like the sort of the healing, the transformative rituals that, yes. that, that there used to be. Like, why, why has there been a decline of that sort of ritual, particularly in the West? And what do you think of the consequences of that have been? That's a good question. I think there's been a hijack of the Western mind. It's been in place now and growing for the last hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, I don't know. There's a constant move towards reason and detail and logic at the expense of empathy and compassion and imagination. So if you like, it's a shift from the right brain to the left brain, though I'm not altogether sure about that, but it appeals to the masculine. I do know that. I mean, we like lists and clarity and and measurement, nerdy stuff. It's all good, but over time, we lose contact with that other wilder side of ourselves, with the, the sensual and the imaginative part of us. And if that bit of us if that's the bit that loves ritual and we separate from it, then at that point, the rituals we do begin to hollow out and they have less meaning and they become empty, empty ceremonial. Is that making sense? That makes sense. This is something that Nietzsche talked about, about the Apollonian Absolutely. and the Dionysian. Absolutely. And, and ritual is about descent. It is about uh, Dionysian descent. And we live in an Apollonian ascendant society. We want to get up there. We want to get into, and we, we like to get into the spiritual. We're not so keen on getting into the soulful. What do you think? What, so what's the difference between the two? I, th- I, think, I think we are talking about Nietzsche's Apollonian and, and Dionysian distinction. I think that there used to be ancient mysteries and what we might think of as the soul, the psyche, it needs to experience, it needs to feel, it needs to go down, if you like. Whereas there is a quality in the human spirit that wants to rise up to, it wants cleanliness and, and sort of intellectual rigor. It wants, it wants a view, it wants to see from above. And that's not the case with the soul. So I think that's a distinction that we can make. And certainly in men's work and in the work that I was doing, have been doing over the last 30 years, I think that's very true for me. Well, before we get into talking about the type of rituals that you talk about in the book, mm. let's, let's do some definitions here. We're going to be Apollonian here for, uh, for a second. Uh, <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> what, what makes a ritual a ritual? Are there certain components that need to be in place? Yeah. Well, 
You enter a different space when you enter a ritual. You cross a threshold. Your psyche or your soul, let's call it what we will, enters a different territory, either a, ter- either a place, a physical location, a difference, or an imaginal territory, a sphere, a place of, uh, a place where you can do ritual work. The ritual then, the ritual itself then gives your soul a message. So there's a distinction that says that a ritual is a symbolic action through which the soul or the psyche can receive and understand a message. You know, the reality is the soul, and I'm using the word soul here, and you may choose to use the word psyche, Brett, but I'm using the word soul. The soul is a bit like a chicken. It can't count. It doesn't do data, but it can and does operate in symbols. It sees pictures and it understands pictures. And for instance, I have a wedding ring on my finger here. When that ring was put on my finger, I understood that that was a symbol that meant my life had changed irrevocably and radically for life. If I were to take that ring off my finger, if I were to ritually take it off, then my life would change again. So that's what I mean by a ritual that actually touches the soul. The symbol touches the soul. Is that clear? That makes clear. So there needs to be a space that you go into. There could be some sort of tool or implementation, like a ring and every other. Yes. Or in, in a church, it could be like the Eucharist is like, or like the tools of the ritual. I mean, the, 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 there's a kind of a commonality to ritual around the world, which is, you know, and, and of course, it's the, the human rule of three, isn't it? There's a beginning, a middle and an end to a story. You start a joke, you tell the joke, you tell them you finished a joke. This is true in three act structure in movies. It's true too in ritual. We have a, we have a beginning, a middle and an end. So that they're all very significant and they have very important roles to play within the ritual. And it sounds like too, uh, an underlying thing that and for this to all to happen, for the, the, this, this place to mean anything, the tools to mean anything, the action to mean anything, there has to be this underlying intent, correct? Absolutely. We, you need an intention. And in a way, the intention gives you a route map, a plan. But the intention is, you, ha- you have to hold that very clearly in your mind, or I'd say in your heart too. But that is a, you need to know why you are there. Because that's what anchors you in the reality at the same time as you're entering entering into this mythical, mystical, misty space that can be ritual. And in these ritual spaces, they don't have to be like a special building or a special room. Like you could possibly create one just in your closet or if you just go outside, that can become a sacred space, uh, a place where you could do a ritual. I did rituals in rehab centers for years. Uh, I've done rituals in the most simple of places, in garages, in uh, gardens and sheds, in uh, all sorts of different places. It's about the space you create. It's like an empty space into which the extraordinary can come. It's not about the bells and the whistles. It's not about the building, though it's, hey, isn't it great to have a wonderful building, you know? I remember walking around Westminster Abbey and thinking, this is like putting your fingers in the plug, but you can do a ritual anywhere. Okay, so we decide to define what a ritual is. There needs to be a, a place, a time set aside from the profane, I guess is what they would say. There's tools that can be used possibly, not necessarily. There is an action that you do that's symbolic, that speaks to the psyche or the soul. And there has to be this underlying intent beneath that. So that so that's how you create the ritual. And you also said that a ritual is like a story with beginning, middle, and end. Yes, yes. There are stages, phases, call it what you will. Um, this guy called uh, Van Gennep, who wrote a book on rites of passage, started off a whole process of, of study. And he would say that there were three stages to a rite of passage, a separation, an ordeal, and a return. Now, in our secular world, words like ordeal can become a little bit overlarded and overloaded, if you know what I mean. So in my work, I tend to think of separation transformation and return. Ceremonially, we can do all sorts of things, but a decent ritual needs those three distinct phases, stages. You can do it going up in an elevator. It's not about time. You can do it going up, as I said, in an elevator if you want, but as long as you go somewhere different in the landscape of your mind, 
you have separated, you've made a change, then something transformational can happen and you need to return. And that's very often the bit in rituals that we forget, actually, is the return. We need to ground ourselves. We need to come back to the here and now. I think of it as ritual hygiene. Uh, we need to take care around that because otherwise we can kind of get lost in that that lovely ritual space, that liminal space that we talk about. And we can wander around in that for years. Well, you gave a good example of this that, I, that I've experienced personally. Like a concert is a ritual in a way, right? There's a space where you, you set aside to play music yeah. and you, you, you listen and then... But then, like, it, you have this transformative experience, possibly, but then it just ends, right? It's, it's that's, that, that's the feeling you're talking about, like, not returning. You just, like, yes. end it, and then you just, like, walk out, and you feel kind of like, whoa, what just happened? Absolutely. And that's why so many people find it so hard to leave a good concert, because they're plugged in. And no one said, oh, by the way, guys, it's over now. Thank you very much. So long, and thanks for all the fish. It's, uh, they, they've, not, um, they've not had the closure that they need to be able to get back into the world because the concert is very often a magical experience. It's an experience of the other, whatever we care to call it. But at that point, we are fully committed to that. And that's quite difficult. So we need something that clearly says, thank you very much indeed, which is why in theatre, you used to have the lights coming up or the a curtain being drawn. It's, the, it's a closure. It's thank you very much. We're done now. So, uh, th- and I'll, I want to point out too that this story or this this these phases of ritual you pointed out. This is also something that Joseph Campbell talks about in his book. Absolutely, right here with a thousand yeah. faces, the hero's journey. Yes, and the and the hero's journey is in itself a classic rite of passage. It is a journey of descent. So it's Dionysian. You go into an underworld. You you meet guides and strangers and you fight battles and you discover a treasure and you then you are changed by the experience and then you come back over the threshold and you bring your treasure back to the world. That's that's a pretty simplistic view of it, but that's a uh, that's a very similar journey. And and Joseph Campbell, in his wisdom, saw this recurring again and again and again in mythologies around the world. I would say that it also happens in rituals around the world. But then I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it does. It does sound like a ritual is essentially you, you are acting out sto- a sto- like this archetypical story of yeah. the hero's journey. I think. I think these were the mysteries of old. You know, we talk of the Eleusinian mysteries. We talk of we talk of ancient mystery rites. I think these rituals, these often that I imagine them to be initiatory rituals. I think they were they followed a prescribed route. And certainly the rituals I know in the indigenous world tend to follow a root map and a pattern. And they are all about descent and ordeal. And some of them are true ordeals and to return and to come back and then to re-enter society. In certain rituals in Africa, when you have been through an initiatory ritual, you return to society with a different name. You are that different. Let's talk about another component of rituals is the communal aspect of it. Does that, is this like, do you need a community have to have a ritual or can you do it by yourself? Or is it like, like the community part, like make rituals more powerful? I think communities, I think we're ritual making animals, aren't we? I mean, there are good reported stories of chimpanzees creating communal rituals. This is not a, it's not a thing confined to humankind, but, uh, but we are in community, uh, ritualistic. I think that community makes for better rituals in many aspects. I think it makes for, it makes for deeper, more powerful rituals. Certainly, uh, the notion of the village as a basis for a ritual is very powerful. And the gathering together, and sometimes these communities can be instant communities. I mean, a, a men's gathering is an instant community of men from all over the world. But it forms a community of like mind and interest. And at that point, the rituals deepen. And of course, this is the, this is the important thing in this, this work of descent is that you can create depth through creating trust, through creating levels of understanding. And that's what gives rituals added power. You can certainly do a ritual on your own and it can be transformational. But if you're starting out, 
to do ritual. If you're wanting to explore the notion of ritual, I don't think you can really do any better than finding yourself a ritual men's group and sitting in a circle with men and working out what works and what doesn't work in ritual space. Well, let's talk about this this men's work that you've been talking about. In in the book, you talk that's how you got your start. You, you joined a men's group and you start taking part in ritual. And uh, you talk a bit about Robert Bly. Now, for uh, some of our listeners might remember Robert Bly. They're old enough to remember he wrote Iron John. And he really kind of kickstarted this mythopoetic men's movement in the 80s and 90s. But that's, he's kind of, you know, I think a lot of younger listeners might not know about him and the cultural impact he had. So talk a little bit like what Robert Bly was trying to do with, with Iron John and the other stuff he was doing. Yes. Well, he was a poet, a very fine poet and a brilliant translator. If you ever see, if he. If you ever see any of his books lying around in secondhand bins and bookshops and bookshelves, give them a try. They are really good, solid pieces of work, and his translations are extraordinary. But uh, oh, we're now talking over 30 years ago, 35 years ago, he started traveling around America and around the world eventually, giving poetry readings and, and opening up discussions. He's a he's one of those guys who just likes to talk to people. He likes to hear. He really likes the feedback that he gets. And what he was beginning to perceive was that men, young men in America, were very often naive, as he would put them. They were, they liked to be liked. They were kind of soft and kind of up in their heads and, and, and willing to please and a little bit afraid of their own fierceness and their own energy. And he began to look at that. And he began to think in terms of grounding these young men. And basically what he was seeing, and if we return to Nietzsche, he was seeing the Apollonian in young men in, in the generations below him. And he wanted to bring back the Dionysian aspect to help them to get through to a more mature and aligned and, well, that's without putting words in his mouth, I'd say a more powerful, mature masculinity. And he did that for some years. He, he wrote Iron John, which he, in which he used story. And later in the workshops he did, he used poetry to address the issues that were coming up. Fierceness, wildness, the issues that we have around our fathers, the issues we have around war, the issue, the deeper issues in men's lives. And he would use a poem to almost surgically to drop into a subject, open it up. And at that point, men could begin to experience their their anger, their grief, their, their deeper feelings. And that's what he was really good at. He was very brave. He was very imaginative. And... Uh, he, he brought a lot of teachers out with him and Mick signed up with a lot of guys and, uh, and traveled the world and did some remarkable work in his time. He also began to hook up with indigenous teachers, with guys from West Africa and Guatemala, men from indigenous cultures who brought a tribal sensibility with them. And that's when I kind of really perked up. And I began to see the, the huge possibilities of ritual in that. But he was a, a great lover of ritual. And you, you can still see his influence today amongst men's groups. Oh, huge. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole idea, like with a lot of men's groups, they focus on the archetypical like ideas of masculinity. Like, yeah. well, Draw Lai was doing that 35 years ago. Absolutely. And, and also, we must remember that he teamed up with people like James Hillman. You know, we're talking about great thinkers here. These are not, they're not weekend workshop guys in that sense. These are, these are people who are, are deep thinkers who have really made the journey and returned with their own gold, which they were sharing with us as men. So Michael Mead, James Hillman, Robert Moore, Maladoma Some, Martin Prechtel, John Lee, these guys, they were really giving a gift and they transformed the lives of many men. And you can still see it today. I think it's interesting, this uh, Jordan Peterson phenomenon that's going on right now. You know, say what you want about it. But like he's tapping into that same thing that Robert Bly tapped into 35 years ago. I think he is. And whether you go for it or whether you don't, he's, he's beginning, you know, he's begun, re-begun the debate. He's 
kind of got people interested. Suddenly, words like stoicism and uh, uh, rigor are back in back on the agenda in a way that they haven't been for a while. So let's talk about the, the role of ritual in a man's life. So Robert Bly, he saw that men were lacking of fierceness. They felt maybe lost. They were naive. How do you, do you think it's because of a lack of ritual, like a rite of passage that men, particularly men in the West, like lack? I, I think, think so. I think we've lost our, we've lost our natural, and I'm using the word tribal here, but, but we've lost our natural tribal rituals of initiation for young men. We, we tend not to go down that path anymore. And because of that, we, as young men, we self-initiate. We kind of fall in love with death in a little bit of a way. We we go stealing motor cars and we do extreme sports and we get ourselves into fights and so on and so forth as a way of, of experiencing our manhood. Now, the reality is you can't, no one can give you your manhood. You have to take it. But at the same time, that needs to be done in a safe space where you can be tested, where you can be met by other men, where you can learn about other men as you're going through a deep initiatory process. So that's, a, that's what we don't have anymore. And I think that's a, that's a real loss in our culture. Yeah, I would say we've, I've heard people say, or write, that we've replaced rites of passage in a man's life with rites of achievement, right? It's like you get the job. <laughs> That's, you that's get the girl, yes. you get the money. That's, that's absolutely true. But I mean, that it, but it's like not fulfilling, right? Like it's there's no beginning to it. There's no end. Absolutely. You're not grounded, and so it, you're, you're always left like wanting more. You know, when we think of achievement, once again, we think of rising up, don't we? We think of getting up there, getting to the top of the greasy pole, climbing to the top of the pyramid. That is what we think of when we think of achievement. It's very competitive. What we what we tend to lose sight of in that is that we. We're going up into our head at the same time. We're not connecting with our body. And what Bly was giving us, what those sort of people were saying, was that there was an understanding that these were messages to be embodied. I once, <laughs> I have a memory of uh, introducing Robert Bly once in a, in an event in England, Southern England. And I said to him, well, what do you want me to say about you? And he said, uh, just describe me as some kind of animal. I said, okay. So I stood up and I said, well, this is Robert Bly and he's a bit like a bear. At which point this voice behind me said, what do you mean a bear? <laughs> and it was in his body. You know, that was it. He embodied his thinking, his ideas. He was fully present in his life. He was totally authentic. That's what he was giving us. He was giving us access to that in ourselves. And many of us, by going up into our heads, by becoming heady and intellectual, we are avoiding our bodies, but we're also avoiding our feelings. Let's say there's a man who's listening to this and they they want it, they 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 missed out on a rite of passage. And like say they're in their 30s and 40s. Is it too late for them to experience a rite of passage, or is that something they could do today? Not at all. Not in the least. Um, I think I did my first true rite of passage would have been I'd have been oh, I'd have been getting on for 40, if not over 40. It's not, about, it's, it's not about your physical age. It's about your psychic readiness. It's about your willingness to undergo a transformational experience. Now, many men who go through such a rite of passage can go through a rite of passage at the age of 20, and they don't actually do it because they're in their head or they, they don't want to engage with it. That's fine. But usually by the age of 40, Many men now have had their, their life experiences has given them enough pain and enough grief and enough doubt about themselves as men to really need to make some kind of a change. And that's the, those are the kind of men that we used to meet. So, so it's not about age. It's about has, has life knocked you about a bit and are you ready? That's the way it used to work. And I think that that age has actually come down with issues around pornography and globalization and work and 
and, and things like the Me Too movement and things like climate change, we are under pressure in a different sort of a way. And to balance all that with the need to provide, because that hasn't gone away, so the age-old need to provide, provide, and also to balance that with the need to be the new sensitive man that we hear about. That's a stretch. And at that point, men are under enough pressure to want to gather with other men and have a good look-see. And the best way to do that is through a ritual. And what does that ritual look like? I mean, I imagine it's going to be different for depending on the group you're a part of or your ba- cultural background. But like in general, what is that going to look like? Uh, very often it's about meeting, oh, I don't know, up to, up to 100, 200, 300 strangers. So, so immediately you have that male question of, uh oh, is this going to come off? You know, have, have I done the right thing coming here? So then you spend some time getting to know other men, small groups, hanging out with men over dinner, whatever that might be. And you begin to build a level of trust. You then get to the feelings, uh, uh, sometimes around anger and irritations that need to be expressed before you can all go into a ritual space. And that's the bit that brings out the creativity, that brings out the, the need to really, really undergo something. Men see that they're building something together, this process, and that they go through it, usually with someone who's got enough wisdom, I suppose, to to say, well, we, there other men have gone down this path before. It is okay. You're going to get a stretch, but it is okay. And I, I imagine for a lot of these young guys or men, the same problem that Bly saw 35 years ago, this naivety, this lack of fierceness, like probably a lot of that f- transformative work they're doing is like getting in touch with that sort of fierceness within them. Yes. And, and also it, it's not just the fierceness, Brett. Sometimes it's the empathy and the compassion. Sometimes it, what can be stunning for a man is to stand in a circle of men feeling vulnerable feeling exposed, feeling open, and to experience the tenderness of men. That's not often talked about. And that was a salutary lesson for me. But I went into the hole, I went into my grief, I went into my deepest pain, and there were men, strangers, who supported me and helped me through that. That was astonishing. I didn't expect that. I didn't think I had the right to expect that. My past had set me up not to receive. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, and to receive that kind of tenderness, that kind of care and nurture, something I'd always put into the, uh, the feminine pigeonhole, something I'd always denied in myself and denied in other men, to actually receive that kind of empathy, that kind of tenderness, the kind of stuff that you see on a battlefield after the battle. The kind of stuff that you see when boxers put their arms around each other after a fight, that kind of intimacy, that kind of understanding of each other, that's often the case. And it's not, so there is the fierceness, there is the search for, for a kind of a deeper masculinity, but there's also the, the search and the discovery that it's layered. There are more things than just that kind of aggression. There's assertion. But it's something else too, right? And imagine that the one of the goals of the ritual is to like integrate all those different parts, absolutely, and to come away feeling a sense of belonging and wholeness and connection. At its best, that's what a ritual gives you. You actually feel, in a sense, bigger. It's I, it's um uh, I like to think it's a bit like you're a snake sloughing off a skin. Well, if you don't slough off the skin, you can't grow like a lobster. If you don't lose the shell, you can't grow. And that's a bit what it feels like. You feel a little bit, a little bit raw, a little bit edgy, but you know you are growing. You know that something immense has happened. And at its best, that's what happens in those kind of rituals. And where can men uh, go to find groups that do things like this? Oh, I think that I think they're around. I think you I mean you can see them in most cities, rural areas. 
you, you can put out feelers and just say, you know, I'm really interested in joining a men's group. And of course, if there isn't one, you can form one. That's what happened with me. I was at a, 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 a workshop, a seminar with a guy called John Lee, who'd come over to England. And he did the classic thing. He said, uh, there's a guy down here at the, at the front of the room wants to start up a men's group. I would suggest that any man in the room who is not in a men's group should come down here and join this man. So I went down there and there were six or seven guys down there and we formed a men's group and it was absolutely fantastic. It, it was a gift, a huge gift to me. And, uh, at some point we looked at each other and said, who was the man down the front of the room? And John had just done a, a nice thing. I think he just said, well, here's the guy. And we all came down and we were all that man. There was no one man saying, I want a men's group. So my sense is that we can all get together with other men. We can, you can put an advert online. You can email your friends, you know, email people in the expectation that a high proportion of them will say no, or they'll be too busy, or this is woo-woo, or this is rubbish. However, there will be men who are in the same space and say, yeah, I want to do that now. And then there's a lot of stuff to read. There's a lot of stuff to work with. And there are workshops and all sorts of things. There are people out there still. Well, well as I was reading this book, particularly the section on rites of passage, you know, I have a son, he's eight He's kind of getting that, he's getting pretty close to adolescence. And I've been thinking about, well, is there something I can do to, you know, add a rite of passage, create one for him? You know, because we have some in our own faith, but I want something like, it's like, it's a family one. Yeah. What can fathers do? Like, what would a rite of passage look like for their son? Like, what age should they do it? Uh, what are some of the, at least, and it doesn't have to be, I think a lot of guys are listening, they're going to follow this exactly the T, but like, I think more I'm looking for just sort of general ideas uh, of what a rite of passage yeah. for a young boy really would look like. Yeah. Well, I think it has to be triggered by the boy. By that, I mean, there's a point at which a boy starts paying attention and he's clearly engaging sexually at some level. He's looking at girls or whatever he's doing and he's, you know, he, he's out there, he's looking around. And at that point, in traditional cultures, regardless of uh, orientation and sexuality, the, 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 the boy would be oiked out of the family home and taken off to the initiation hut. And I think that that's something that fathers can do for their boys. However, and I'm going to maybe be a bit heretical here, I don't think fathers should ever initiate their boys. I don't think they should initiate their sons. Now, they might be present when he returns for the last part of the ritual, but they shouldn't be there initiating him because it's about a separation, remember? And I said we need to separate. And at that point, it's about developing the trust with the men, creating the group of men whom you can all trust to initiate each other's boys. There's some great work being done through people like Michael Mead and over in this country, people, things like Band of Brothers and those sort of outfits where, where they've worked with troubled youth. And that's the kind of stuff where you can really work with youth to give them the challenges they need. And if a boy is looking over his shoulder at his dad the whole time, how's dad reacting? How's dad taking this? Maybe he doesn't say what he needs to say because dad's in the room. That's why I think dad needs to step out momentarily to give the boy his chance and then to meet him when he comes back in and says, I can see there's something different now and then give a blessing. Is that making sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So it, let's say you have that group of men that you trust uh, and willing to you know, do a rite of passage. Or like what would that rite of passage look like? For, was it just like go out to nature? Is it like, I mean, what, what is that? I think you gather, you need to gather more than once. You need the boys to see the men and to size them up and also to size each other up, incidentally. But you need to, the boys need to hear the men kind of modeling manhood. They need to see what it's like to be a man. And they need to hear what it's like to be a man, to be brought to your knees or punched on the nose or or, or betrayed or lost or all the things that we achieve as men, not to have that inflicted upon them. And I've heard of groups in in America where they shame their boys ritually so that they know just how bad it can be out there. Well, if, you've, if anyone does that in a room to boys, they've got the wrong idea. That's not what kids need. They need 
They need something that is going to help them to stand up and basically shaming them doesn't do it. So you need to, so you need to have the, the sense of a community that the boys are a part of a community. And then you can possibly go away and set up this separation that I'm talking about. You set up a special event and that's when you begin to really bring your creativity to bear. You study rites of passage. You know, you study people like Michael Mead or those kind of folks and you, 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 you see what they're, you see what they're, what they're offering and you see the kind of things that can be done for boys and you you give them a challenge you give them a journey if you like it's almost like recreating uh, uh joseph campbell's descent into the underworld you give them tasks you give them challenges you give them those kind of things and remember they're young so they're not necessarily going to be doing much of the expressive work they're going to be so full of testosterone that they're not really going to be able to to weep in the way that a 45 year old man would weep in an initiatory process but he is, uh, uh, any youth is going to be able to respond in the moment to any kind of a challenge like that. And when they rise to it, they need to be seen to rise to it. And they need to be given either a skill or a means to get through the world or a route map, a sense of what the world is. Now, the group of men can show what the world is like. They can give the boy a route map. And but once he begins to express himself and he shows that he has this, some skill, some gift, maybe he sings a song, maybe he's a bit of a tear away and he's got some other skill, that needs to be named and blessed and brought out into the open. And that's the bit that he takes home. That's the, that's the thing that is seen by the group. And that is the thing that is blessed. Is that making sense? That, that does make sense. And another, I think, point... That I like that you made in the book. We talked about this earlier. Is that even though you might have gone through a rite of passage from from boyhood to manhood, that doesn't have to be the only rite of passage you go through. There are other parts of your life, oh, absolutely. transitory periods, where another rite of passage would be useful. Like, say, you're moving from middle age to elderhood, right? Yeah. That that might call for a rite of passage. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there there, there are innumerable rites of passage. I mean, there's. Um, Oh, what we, there's a new job, a new location. There's a moving from one, one level of status to another, if you like, in our culture. And there's also this, this, the, the move from being single to marriage to, to moving into fatherhood to, uh, moving into old age. I've, um, been undergoing, I underwent a, uh, a ritual which was given to me, uh, in the far north of Sweden, up by the Arctic Circle, uh, uh by some Sami people who basically rebirthed me into old age. Nice. I didn't realize it had happened until I got home, really. But it was a very powerful ritual, and it, it has set me up for my latter years. I'm 66, and it kicked off a whole series of explorations. And it feels like I, I've been undergoing that kind of an initiation over the last two, three years now. We've talked about some like transformative uh, rituals, like particularly the rite of passage, because uh, I think a lot of men are keyed in on that. But you talk about in the book, there are rites of passage, or not even right, there are rituals that you can do on a daily basis. They're small, but like, first off, like, what are those type of rituals? And like, what do you think the benefit of doing something like that is? Well, there are, there are, there are rituals that can appear really crazy. I mean, we can ritualize anything here. You know, that's a, a we, we can, as, you know, by doing it more than once, in a sense, we are ritualizing it. I, I used to have a, uh, as a writer, I used to have a ritual of every day sharpening every pencil and putting it back in the pot, which is really interesting because I'd already started writing on a laptop, but that was my ritual. And what it did was it, it concentrated my mind. It, it got me to pay attention and to focus. So those are, those are little rituals we can give ourselves. For me, it doesn't have to be a big event, but uh, by repeating little things, by paying attention, by seeing things, by opening up. In my case, I um, I use blot, which is a, a little gifty, a little sacrifice. That's a Scandinavian word, blot, that means originally means blood sacrifice. And but that's a, a little gift. I carry little gifties around with me, little beads or stones that I can just give in gratitude for my day. I can give in gratitude for the place where I'm going. What it does is it brings my attention down 
to those things around me. And it gets me out of my head. It gets me connected. And I think those are very important. We don't all meditate. I'm not a great meditator, for instance. I like doing Tai Chi and I like Qigong and I like those kind of things, things that involve some kind of activity. But I'm not so good at sitting on my butt and meditating. So these things give me a way of entering into the world in a slightly different way. And of course, in doing that, I get, I move from my intense focus. And I think we all have that these days, kind of like a concentration on doing things, doing them right, doing the next thing. And I move to a softer focus where the, where things can come in from the edge of my vision, new ideas, new thoughts. In my case, a new poem. Something comes in those moments. And that's what a little momentary ritual on a daily basis can give. Yeah, the, the blot that was new to me. So as you say, when you say sacrifice, you give the little gifts that you like, sometimes you just bury it in the ground. Like that's what you do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. Thank you. Thank you for this. Sometimes I will do it um, in honor of whatever it is I think that has happened in this place. So I will leave a, a, a little pebble or a stone in a forest. Very often, just press it. And then when I walk away from it, it's none of my business. But I will leave it there, honoring what has happened there. Now, I live in a country that is layered upon layered upon layered with thousands of years of history. I'm lucky. I live in Wales, just on the border with England. And there, I have enough history. But every now and again, I'll go for a walk and I'll get a sense of something. And I'll make a little gift in honor of those men and women who lived their lives, who've worked the land, who've hunted here, who have fought and died here, who have whatever that might be. But I will, in an imaginal way, I will honor them. It's almost like an ancestral thing. Is that making sense? No, that makes sense. And at that point, I am connecting with a greater whole. Now, I also choose to honor nature. My, my view of, my view of a creator, of a god, is not of a creator. It's of creation. So I'm, I like to be a part of that. And my way of connecting with that is by giving a gift, by making the connection in exactly the same way as a, in a church, you put some money in the plate. It's no different, really, but it does open up a more direct and it gives me an opportunity to speak. I think there's something very important in speaking out loud. I don't, I don't have any embarrassment now about speaking out loud when I do a private ritual. Speaking that, that brings you present, your persona, your sound is very important. Well, I think for a lot of people who are listening to this, I think they're, they're probably intrigued by rituals. And I mean, they're, I think, but like at the same time, they're afraid to pull the trigger on it because it feels weird or it's woo woo or like, so what do you say to those guys? Like, what do you, what, what, what make the case, make the hard sell for tr- giving rituals a try? Like, how's it going to ch- improve their life or maybe change their life or what, what, what let's, let's do the hard sell. Hard sell. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> That's not very ritual like. <laughs> You're not supposed to yeah, do the hard sell. It's interesting when you talk about the fear, the fear of the woo woo and the weird and the strange and all that stuff. I think that's part of it. I think that's part of what we're talking about in this drift towards the rational and the, the logical. What it means is if, if we are afraid of the, of that weirdness, then we tend to cover it up with something else. We, we tend to shame it or put it down or say, Oh, well, it's just a load of rubbish. But in actual fact, it's good to go with the fear. Poet William Stafford used to talk about, you know, there's a fear out there. That's your life. Go with it. Explore it. Now that's a, that's an interesting notion. And of course, that's what you can do in rituals because you kind of unzip a little bit when you get into a ritual space. That's, that's a very, very important thing. Um, it helps you to enter into the deeper feelings that very often we don't go to. I call it gas work, <laughs> which is grief, anger, and shame. These three, these three in men, they seem to be inextricably linked much of the time. So we feel very angry. But we wrap it in shame, or we feel we feel very sad, but we wrap that in anger, so that we don't have to feel sad, we don't have to feel the grief. In a ritual space, you do feel those things with other men, 
And that's a very potent mix. And it cleans house for you. It really does clean house. If you're in any way addicted, if you've got a, a difficulty, we most of us at some point or another start ritualizing our enti- entry into addictions, be that drink, drugs, sex, food, whatever it is. We, we, rit- we have a ritual way of doing it. Well, there's a ritual way of coming out of it. We can give ourselves rituals to, to come out of the underworld of that addiction, of that behavior, whatever it is. So these are, uh, these are really powerful tools that we have at our disposal. And if we share them with other men, if we have other men to witness us, to, to see us in our, let's call it our unzipped state, you can, you can really do some good. You're also preparing for the future to mark the difference between the past and all its shadow, all its difficulty, all its unhappiness, and a clearer, healthier future. That's when you come out. That's when you can receive the blessing. That's when you can really get the benefit of a ritual. So it can actually do an awful lot of good for you. Well, the way you describe it, I mean, it sounds kind of like therapy, but without going to like the the, the doctor, right? Because I mean, a therapy, like even if you go to like a traditional, like say traditional therapy, it's sort of a ritual. There's a space you go into. Yeah. There's Absolutely. This, this person yeah. who's guiding you through, you know, things in your yeah. life. Yeah, it's 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 therapy without the talk very often. It's therapy by doing. It's a ritual action in a therapeutic space. Now, the reality is there were ritual for millennia before there were ever therapists. You know, we've, we've had what is it James Hillman used to say we've had we've had a uh, uh, we've had a hundred years of psychotherapy and the world's getting worse. But that was a way of actually having a good look at what, what therapy and the therapoise, the, 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 the journey into therapy gave you. Ritual does that, but it does it without the intellectual stimulus that can take months and years to get to the point. I mean, many of us, we go into, we go into therapy on day one, we have a good cry and then we kind of hide ourselves for, for months. Well, in a ritual, you tend not to hide. You can, you can finesse it, but you know you're only cheating yourself. Right, like therapy sounds like it's Apollonian, right? It's a very high level. Well, it can be. It, can it be. certainly can be. I mean, there are, there, are, there are some great body therapies out there. There are some great body-related therapies that, that, touch the, that touch the soul, that really touch the soul through the senses, through the body, through a kind of like a reflective space. Things like pesoboidin system psychomotor, those kind of things, really solid body therapies. Those I think are fantastic. And of course, we mix and match these days, don't we? We do a bit of this, we do a bit of alternative stuff, we do a bit of therapy, we do a maybe go a join up a 12 step fellowship or a piece of recovery work or all these things. They can support each other like the different legs of a stool so that we don't fall over. Well, William, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about your work? <laughs> I've enjoyed it immensely, I have to say. Well, I've got a sad little website, uh, which is uh, williamayot.com. And there, uh, if you want to go and uh, have a look there, you can express, there's a place where you can sign up and express an interest in the kind of work that I'm doing. So we're currently thinking about uh, another, a second ongoing group training people here in the UK. But also I'm thinking about uh, setting up an online training seminars uh, around the ideas of ritual. So if you want to go and sign up there, I think it uh, asks you where you might be coming from, or by that I mean which country you're living in. Then we can kind of get back to you and and ask a little bit more about that. There is the book, of course, which is Reenchanting the Forest, Meaningful Ritual in a Secular World, and that's available on Amazon and other outlets. And let's just not make it all about me. You can get in touch with other men. There's a lot of stuff out there. And I think that once we feel the call, and it is a call, it might be through my work, but, but it might just be that you, that, that the idea of ritual brings you in contact with other men. That's really worth it. I've, on my website, I've also got a questionnaire for men, which I'm setting up, which will be, uh, giving me the material and the information to check out many things. I'm, I'm writing a new book for and about men in the wake of globalization and climate change and feminism and uh, the internet, how that has changed our lives. So I want to hear from men. So anyone who wants to sign up to that questionnaire will be very welcome. So that's about it. Fantastic. Well, William, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Great.
It's been really good. Thank you very much, Brett. My guest today was William Ayot. He's the author of the book, Reenchanting the Forest. It's available on amazon.com. You can find more information about his work at his website, williamayot.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash ritual, where you can find links to resources, where you can delve deeper into this topic.